97.5 FM. Kaiser Radio. And of course, in Georgetown, Guyana, this is Charles Sugram. We're starting a new program today on Kaito Radio 99.1, 99.5 FM. It's also streaming on YouTube and on Facebook. We want to welcome you to our inaugural program. We'll, ha we'll be having these programs every two weeks, right here, at the same time. And we'll have many, many guests, professional Guyanese discussing the oil talk with OGGN Guyana. That is our program tonight. Today, we will discuss an oil contract for Guyana just requiring counting of oil barrels extracted. Before I begin our program and introduce our honored guests, I just want to give you a little history of OGGN. A few years ago, after the Petroleum Sharing Agreement, that is the PSA, signed by the coalition, was made public, a group of patriotic Guyanese met in New York to begin to analyze the oil contract. Getting the team together was a gentleman out of Canada, Darsh Kushial, an engineer, and he was so involved and so passionate about Guyana that he just put us together to form a group. We met frequently at my Passat home here in New York. It was agreed that we register a not-for-profit organization. This was duly done, and we registered OGGN, which is Oil and Gas Governance Network. We have been on Liberty Avenue quite often on Leffers and by Sybil Bakery, um, sharing out flyers and informing fellow Guyanese of the contract. Um, we do that mostly in the summer months because, of course, uh, more people will stop and speak with you during that time. We also had outreach at the Mandir in Liberty Avenue for a few years. And we had excellent presentation from Guyanese professionals on all aspects of the oil and gas sector. Funding for OGGN has largely been contribution from many Guyanese. In 2022, we took it up a notch higher by making application to the IRS for a 501c3. That was duly approved last year. So we are now officially a 501c3 organization. Now, any contribution to OGGN from persons, business, or whatever it is, they are tax deductible if you live in the United States. So please, if you think that it's good for us, for a country, do make a contribution to OGGN. Tonight, as I said, our topic is an oil contract for Guyana, just requiring um, counting of oil barrels extracted. And to help us along that journey tonight in our inaugural program is two professional Guyanese, great sons of Guyana. One is Dr. Andre Brandley. He resides in Switzerland and he's actually in Switzerland today. And the other, of course, is Dr. Cyril Hunt, former ambassador. Gentlemen, welcome to the program tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Okay, Dr. Brandley. Do you want to give us an idea of what, what is the purpose of OTGN? What are really OTGN formed to do? Okay, well, thanks for the opportunity to be on this program. It's a really exciting moment that OGGN has a slot now on Kaiju Radio and, of course, on the social media channels that are associated with this. Now, OGGN, as you said, was started in 2017 with the uh, uh, explicit mi mission to uh, help and educate Guyanese with all issues related to the oil and gas industry that was uh, has been growing and started with uh, First Oil in 2019. Now, um, we were mainly driven by the fact that we want to prevent that Guyana faces the oil curse, uh, which means they, uh, that having this massive influx of oil money can have a very bad effects on the society, on the economy of the country, you get distortions, etc. On top of it, we were also interested in uh, having independent uh, oversight of uh, the oil contracts 
as he, as the Guyanese public knows, the old contract that was signed with Exxon is, say, the least not optimal for the country, in our opinion. And uh, our mission has been to advocate, in general, uh, rule of law, transparency, good governance, accountability, uh, with respect to all oil and gas-based activities in country. It also includes that uh, we want to have strong environmental oversight uh, with regard to the oil and gas exploration activities in the country. And I would like to make it very clear, we are not here to shut down the oil and gas exploration in the country. We want to keep it up to the highest level of standards that are standard actually in Europe, as well as in the US and in Canada, where uh, we have big uh, expat or diaspora Guyanese. So maybe to put it in a nutshell, our mission is to inform and educate the Guyanese public on issues regarding uh, oil and gas. We would like to engage uh, local and international media to uh, inform them about um, what is going on in these areas in Guyana. And we would like to advocate, as mentioned already, transparency, accountability, and good governance by engaging in a dialogue with the government of Guyana, with CARICOM member states, and with international organizations that could help and advise us and Guyana and the people of Guyana that we can optimally uh, exploit and profit from the uh, oil and gas uh, resources that have been found off the coast of Guyana. I would also like in uh, sort of closing on this aspect to make some uh, a few points very clear. There have been allegations in the Guyanese press that we are anti-government, that we are paid by shadowy uh, sources and so on. We are very transparent about our uh, financing, as was pointed out by Charles Sugrim, the host, we are supported by small donations from Guyanese abroad. Um, <clears throat> we are have never favored or endorsed any party in Guyana, and we are uh, strictly staying neutral with regard to um, <clears throat> any party preferences. Of course, individually, we have people that have uh, leaned to one or to the other side, but OGGN has never made a statement in that respect. And of course, the incumbent government will get, uh, you know, we will address issues that we think need to be addressed. But this doesn't mean that we are anti-government. We only just want to get uh, the oil contracts, environmental issues addressed according to the laws of Guyana. And if we feel that this is not done, we speak out. So... <clears throat> uh, in a nutshell, that's essentially what's the mission of OGGN. We are a group of professionals with different backgrounds. We have academics, we have professional people, we have people with backgrounds in tax law, etc. Plus, we also have a growing network of specialists in the oil industry that uh, we can tap in to get their opinion. And uh, we see our role really to uh, uh, educate and inform the Guyanese public. We do this by writing letters in the Guyanese media. You've seen letters uh, by myself, for example, but by other prominent members of OGGN. And today's topic will be one of the letters that was spearheaded by uh, Kendrick Hunt, and we're going to talk more about that. So uh, in closing, uh, back to you, Charles. Thank you, Dr. Brandley. Well said. And Dr. Hunt, as Mr. Bradley, uh, Dr. Bradley just said, um, we are at information dissemination. We are neither anti-government nor anti-opposition. We, we do not uh, support any political um, movement. We don't support any political party. We are free of politics. And we want to make that very clear to the Guyanese people that whatever we say on our program and in our writings, it's all what in our professional judgment is good for our country. So when we speak something that the government do not conform to. It is not that we are anti-government. It is our perspective, is our view, and we hope that the government will at least listen to other views. Dr. Hunt, what do you say of that? 
Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me this evening to this very important discussion about the use of oil in Guyana, one of our natural resources, and in this case, a non-renewable natural resource, which means we have to be very careful about how we proceed. My view is that professional help given by Guyanese in Guyana and overseas is important for us looking at what we could benefit from what belongs to the Guyanese people. So for us, it must be one of professionalism, providing solid advice based on facts and evidence from a theoretical as well as from a practical standpoint. I think that the work by this particular organization is important because we want to think that the contract that we now have has some limitations. And I know we get into a lot more details on that a little bit later on. Our last letter highlighted some of the things we think might be useful for the Guyanese people and the government of Guyana to consider. And I know we'll touch on some of those in a short while. We know also that the company um, EEPGL, which is a, a combination of three different uh, companies, they have their objectives of what they're about. And their objectives are certainly different than what the people of Guyana should be looking after. I will stop here because I'd like to share this conversation with everyone. Thank you, Charles and Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Han. And I want to get directly into our discussion tonight. Um, our topic again is an oil contract for Guyana just requiring counting of oil barrels extracted. And there was a letter written by OGGN of which both of you gentlemen and I myself signatory to that letter. And it spells out what, what OGGN is recommending to the government. So you are, you, we, are, we have told the public is we have had oil now, we have discovered oil eight years ago. We have actually re got some revenue about three years now when production started. Guyana is getting 14.5% of total revenue. The oil companies are getting 85.5%. Now, our model that you guys propose, which I want to discuss now with you, is in line with what the IMF and Global Witness has reported in the report. So, Dr. Hunt, you want to start the discussion on that. What is the yes. proposal? Yes, the proposal is based on the fact that Guyana is starting from what we're going to call a disadvantage in that we don't have expertise in Guyana to do the type of real-time accounting that is required. If you look at how the benefits for Guyana is to be collected, one, it's royalties, and two, it's um, profits after a certain amount of money has been deducted from the revenue. And in this case, it is 75% off the top of the total revenue received. And now for us to be able to verify what that 75% in terms of cost is made up of, we have to have a series of accounting and auditing experts. And right now, Guyana does not have those individuals available. Only recently, the person in charge of the Guyana Revenue Authority says that they don't have the staff to do it. And if you would have had a chance to read Dr. Alan uh, Gulseran's report this past week in Kaicho in, in Stabrook News, you'll see he has pointed out some limitations of what is required in the audits that were submitted. So trying to resolve how you could verify what you're getting in terms of statements from the company, the EPGL, is a task that we have not been able to do very well. Oil production and, I mean, extraction, and I use the word extraction here, extraction here is not production. I'll tell you about that later on. It's an extraction operation because what you're doing is not producing anything. You're just extracting something that has already been created by nature. So we don't have the expertise on the ground. We need a very simple way to measure what is coming out. And what we are proposing in our proposal is that we want to count barrels. We don't want to do an accounting work that requires expertise in those areas. And to be able to do accounting in a field that we are not qualified in 
over the years that we've been involved, we don't have the expertise either at the technical level nor at the accounting level. So what we've devised in our particular model is what we call a gross sharing model. It says, let us count barrels. That's the only objective measure that we can work with. And there would be no difficulty with transparency. We need people to stand on the, the, the FPSOs and count the barrels. And then we will have a more complete way of understanding what is coming out of the ground. Now, the current contract says that I should get 14, 14.5%. Let us put that in barrel terms. It really means 14 and a half barrels we will get out of every 100 barrels. And that is going to remain for the life of this project. There is nothing in the contract to say that that particular relationship will change. We feel that that particular arrangement will not net Guyana the kind of benefits that we think we should have because there are other limitations in that PSA that is now existing. So when we look at where we're supposed to be going, we want a simple, transparent methodology for accounting barrels. If we can count the barrels, we don't have to worry with all the sophisticated uh, technological measurements. We don't have to worry about all the fancy accounting arrangements that go into that preparing of the income expenditure statements and balance sheets. So for now, those are some of the initial things I'd like to state, and I'll stop here for now to get an input from you. Thank you, Dr. Hunt. Dr. Bradley, um, as I want to pick up on what we just heard, one is that um, we will be getting 14.5%, and some Guyanese believe that, um, in, based on the writing in the newspaper, that this 14.5 will somehow increase to a higher percentage when the cost for drilling is has been recovered. Now we know that there is no ring fencing and the likelihood of Exxon stop taking 75% from the revenue for cost recovery seems to be in the distant future. What is What are your views on that? I think, you know, we have to define two things. Uh, one, there's the term FPSO, of course, that uh, Kendrick just used. These are these uh, production boats offshore that uh, are involved in the extraction process. They basically process the raw oil that is coming up from the ground, separates the gas and the water and stores it there uh, that they can be then pumped onto ships that will take it then to the uh, oil markets uh, where the oil will be sold. That's just to define that term in case uh, the audience doesn't uh, is not aware what FPSO means. So we're talking about offshore production boats and all Guyana's oil reserves are offshore. So you need these boats and they are not in shallow water. So you cannot have like a, uh, you need a floating uh, situation because we're talking about uh, oil reserves that are one kilometer below the sea level. That's one thing. The other point uh, is the issue of ring fencing, which is also, again, a technical term that probably most of the audience might not know exactly what you mean. It's uh, Ring fencing means that each uh, 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 floating boat has to be self-financing. So uh, you can control that by having small uh, oil blocks that you have given to the, uh, that you have licensed to all companies. Now, the uh, Starbrook block is huge. It's two thirds of the surface of Switzerland, just to keep that in mind. Uh, so it's a huge, so uh, in a way, that way the production sharing agreement with Exxon and its partners is written. It allows uh, for Exxon to rapidly move ahead to develop additional oil field, uh, 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 oil fields that they have discovered. On the other hand, as uh, Charles mentioned, uh, you, it's almost impossible to get to a point where uh, costs are actually recovered and the amount of profit oil that uh, Guyana will be sharing with Exxon will be beyond those 25% that will be split up between Exxon and, uh, and, uh, and its partners and uh, Guyana. 
So we are in a situation where for the uh, foreseeable future, we're going to be left with those 14.5% that you have uh, uh, mentioned. Now, I see uh, a bunch of issues here, and I think the uh, the proposed model is very interesting because we have, have to keep in mind that the issue of being able to do auditing is evident already now. We have two audits that cover uh, the period of 1999 to 2017, so the, the pre-oil production period. It covers uh, 18 years. That audit uh, covers 1.7 billion uh, US dollars, not completed yet. And we have another open audit uh, for the period of 2018 to 2020, which covers uh, costs of 7.3 billion uh, US dollars. Again, that audit has not been completed. So it's very clear that Guyana uh, is not able to do these audits in a timely manner. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. As you might know, we're going to have a situation, the, the government will be auctioning off uh, three uh, deep uh, water oil blocks uh, in the coming uh, weeks. So uh, actually, it's got, the auction is, is going to be ending in two weeks. So we have three blocks uh, in deep sea and uh, 11 in shallow waters. If there is oil found there, we'll have the same issue. And the uh, two uh, the revised production sharing agreements are essentially very similar to the production sharing agreement that Exxon has signed with the uh, coalition government at the time. So the auditing problem won't get less. The auditing problem is going to get much worse. And we're talking about a country of 800,000 people. So I think we are really in a situation where we have to think radically different. How do we want to uh, uh, regulate how we are sharing the oil with our uh, with the oil companies, and the, um, <clears throat> the growth split model has the advantage that you basically decide: okay, you get a particular share. What we are proposing is fifty-five barrels go to Guyana and forty-five barrels go to the oil company. And then it's left up to the oil company uh, how fast it can recover its expenses out of that. Guyana has these 55 barrels that it will get, and uh, it will get right from the beginning, it will get a substantial share of its, uh, you know, of its natural resources uh, uh, that it could use, could sell, of course, and that they can use that those revenues for development infrastructure for uh, education, etc. So uh, we basically can get rid of all the auditing issues. Yeah, if you can see, also with seven point three billion, you, uh, doing a deep and thorough audit is a uh, is uh, impossible. You can just do spot checks, and uh, we're going to have more, more and more auditing coming up for us to do. So uh, I think we should seriously consider. Uh, this uh, model, which is very simple, and which is not something you know, it's it's not a uh, a pie in the sky. Uh, Indonesia is a country that uses exactly this uh, model, so it's not that we are reinven we are, uh, we are not reinventing the wheel. It is a uh, a revenue sharing model that is applied and that is in action in a country like Indonesia. And uh, I think, you know, one of the first things is that maybe the present government might want to talk to people in Indonesia and see what's their experience. So we should really consider this and see, uh, wouldn't this make life for, for Guyanese and for the Guyanese government easier if we uh, could get rid of most of the auditing? Back to you. John. Thank you, Dr. Brandley. And again, you're listening to Kaito Radio 99.1, 99.5 FM. Um, gentlemen. Um, I think for the viewers uh, tonight, um, I'm not sure if they quite understand, and maybe they did, they do. But currently, we all agree we're getting 14.5, as Dr. Hunt said, 14.5 barrel for every 100 barrels. However, the contract says when the cost for exploration has been repaid, 
then Guyana will get a bigger share of the profit because the profit will be larger now, not the 75% anymore. The cost will not be 75%, the cost will be operating costs. But gentlemen, I did analysis last year for 2022. The oil company 75% cost recovery, they got 7 billion US dollars. How much of that went for expiration costs? How much of that went for operating costs? We don't know that. And both you gentlemen are absolutely correct. We don't have accountants who are qualified in oil and gas. We don't have the professionals who can go and audit Exxon books. So we are kind of wasting our time and it costing us money as well. So this proposal that OGGN came up with, just for audience to understand, Global Witness also had a similar model. They were saying 10% royalty, 25% taxes, and 50-50 share, which comes up to about the same 55 barrels. IHS Markle, their model was 10% royalty, 10% tax, and 50-50 share of profit. So it's almost similar to that. Um, both of these um, entities came up in a ballpark about 55 barrels that you know you, you're proposing now. So to our audience out there, instead of going to all this detail to go into audit and to verify the cost incurred by the oil companies, we're saying leave that alone. Don't even try to do that. Let us do a simple model. And gentlemen, sometimes it's so simple, it's difficult to understand. So you're saying very simple, let us change that model that we have now, put aside all the others, 55 barrels of every 100 produce goes to Guyana, 45 barrels stays with the oil company. Now, Dr. Hunt, you said that we'll be on the SPO to count barrels, but I think those days are gone now. So we'll have meters, we'll have calibration. So we ensure our engineers who are there they can ensure they can monitor the production to give us an accurate count of how many barrels was produced. Yes, good observation. I use that to give you the sense that it can be done either way. In fact, what you can have is both. Once a couple of people lodging on the FPSOs themselves, and you can have something done electronically to transfer the information. The key difference here is that your accounting for barrels must be separate from what the company is using. We cannot, we call piggyback on what they are using because you get him back into the same old position of not being able to verify independently. So we want independent verification. It can be done at two levels, one person or a team on the boat itself. And we have the electronic uh, access stationed in Guyana. And there's a 24 hour operation every single day to manage and to measure what is coming out. So that's the approach we are suggesting. And, you know, we're talking about a limited number of boats, you know. Uh, the uh, mm -hmm. the planning of the government is talking about, uh, by 2030, around 10 uh, uh, production boats offshore. So this is, mm -hmm. you know, this is overseeable. Uh, the new, uh, the auctions of the new oil fields uh, there, you know, we we probably see first oil, if at all, earliest in ten years. So we'll have enough time then to uh, work out and figure out how we do this properly until other oil fields come uh, on, uh, other oil blocks become uh, ready for uh, uh, first oil and for oil production or oil extraction, as Kendrick would say. Yeah, and also let me just add this: some of the monies we are getting now we can hire and get the technology to have that linkage going immediately. That should be part of your first kind of expenses coming out of the oil industry because we want full information. We don't want to have secondary information coming to us and we don't want to depend on audited financial statements, which are many times years behind the reality that we have. And let me just make this point. When you have a non-renewable resource like oil, once the extraction process starts, there is nothing there in the ground after so many years. And once you start increasing your extraction rates, the projected time frame that you initially given could suddenly cut in half by putting in all the new extraction operations. 
And those are some of the concerns you must bear in mind with looking at getting a right value and share today. You cannot wait for it down the road. What we are doing is using existing re re revenues to pump into new, what we call reservoirs. So that particular capital share index that is coming out, out of current revenues, that will continue for a long time. For as long as they have unexplored lands, those extra revenues will go towards opening new reservoirs. And we will be stuck at that 14.5 barrels out of every 100. And that is exactly what we are saying. And of course, some um, who support the administration move that not to renegotiate. And we'll come into that renegotiation in a second. But gentlemen, so we have the 14.5% that we're getting now, or 14.5 barrel per 100, compared to the proposed 55 barrels. What are the pros and cons of the current stablock PSA versus the proposed growth split that you gentlemen so eloquently are um, proposing? I could make a couple of comments on that. Yes. The current PSA says we are going to get 2% royalty, which is one the, among the lowest in the world. Most oil countries, uh, countries producing oil, got something far higher. Our neighbor in Suriname getting something bigger. Then the next concern we should raise is profits. Profits, you're saying, before you calculate profits, you have to take out 75% of your revenue. And we can't verify those cost items. So that immediately puts you at a disadvantage. And there are others. Of course, you mentioned the uh, ring fencing as an issue. And then we have the other concern where Guyana is supposed to give tax receipts to Exxon and EPGL at the end of the year, when in fact, they're not paying anything on taxes. That too is a serious difficulty to live with. In our model, we don't have to worry with collecting royalties. We don't have to worry with profit calculations. All we need is to count the barrels and that will be a transparent process. Everybody could count, everybody could measure, and there is no difficulty in figuring out how the shares will go. And let me just make a general point. I saw something published not so long ago in Kaicho News of uh, Kathy Michels. She is the senior vice president and chief financial officer of Exxon Mobil. And this is what she said based on the KN report reported on May 14, 2013, 20, 2023. She says that Exxon Mobil, the oil company, will spare no efforts in maximizing value from Guyana on all fronts as quickly as possible. Let me say that again. The oil giant will spare no efforts in maximizing value from Guyana on all fronts as quickly as possible. That is very clear what is being said about where they're going with this process. Because as you remember, they have to answer to their shareholders. And their shareholders say, we want maximum returns from their investments, which the management of Exxon will provide. They will look at ways to extract the oil as quickly as possible. And they would want to have what we call an exit strategy to get them out there very quickly without any difficulties in leaving when the oil is finished. So they have a clear program. Guyana has, must have a clear program as well. Those are my comments. Dr. Bradley, you want to add anything to that pros and cons of the new existing contract with the new proposed one? Yeah, sure. I can add some additional points. I think Kendrick addressed most of the points already. I would maybe say, I mean, there are some advantages with the Starbrook production sharing agreement, which one maybe should still point out. I think, you know, not everything is, uh, you know, black and white. Mm -hmm. uh, so where do I see advantage in the current Starbrook uh, uh, production, Starbrook block production sharing agreement? Uh, what we've seen is an unprecedented rapid development of all fields of the uh, of the shore, uh, offshore in Guyana. I think this, if one just looks at the history, it has never been this fast, which has, of course, advantages. 
uh, because it means that uh, uh, Guyana is getting some oil revenues fast. Just compare this to Suriname. Suriname has uh, made their offshore discoveries uh, two, three years after Guyana, and they still don't have any uh, 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 any oil production, offshore oil production happening. They've got, of course, uh, decades of onshore oil production, uh, which is relatively small, but no offshore production. So the current Starbuck block uh, PSA had definitely catalyzed the rapid expansion and development of the oil fields. But this does not mean that we should not think about doing things differently because now we have experience uh, with oil production offshore. We have experience what it means to audit, which we didn't have. I mean, nobody of us, the only oil experts that Guyana had at the time are people in the diaspora working in Trinidad and in the Houston, Texas area uh, that are, uh, you know, that basically migrated there. But those people were not the people advising the government back uh, in 2015 to 16 when we had these negotiations about the oil contracts. And the Starbuck block uh, PSA was not a complete reinvention. It based it was based on a model agreement that was already under, uh, I think, the uh, uh, Janet. Uh, Jagan's administration, it was uh, finalized in 1999. So this is not, uh, it was based on something that existed already. And uh, we didn't have at the time a thorough analysis about the alternatives. One also has to keep in mind, of course, the whole geostrategic situation at the time with Venezuela claiming and still claiming two thirds of the countries. Uh, of the of Guyana's territory, particularly the offshore territory, we had seen in the past also uh, Venezuela uh, in, uh, incursing into Guyana, Guyanese territory, blocking uh, uh, oil uh, exploration efforts by some companies. So all this was, of course, part of what uh, made, uh, I guess, both administrations favor this situation, but. Seeing now uh, the problems and difficulties, and I think also what Kendrick mentioned, the uh, the fact that we cannot tax uh, Exxon and uh, its partners will have you no know, massive impact down the road. Uh, I'm not even sure if we really make anything from what we get right now uh, because we're not taxing, and it also will have an impact. Uh, uh, you know, if Exxon is taxed and its partners, it means that they have to take U.S. dollars, bring it to the Bank of Guyana, turn it into um, turn it into Guyanese dollars to pay their taxes, which means the Bank of Guyana gets a foreign currency revenue stream, which it does not get. You can look at the foreign currency uh, numbers of uh, Guyana; they stayed flat. Uh, and I think uh, um, one of the pro-government economists had a, had a paper in uh, Guyana Times uh, two, three days ago, and you can see the numbers there. Uh, so I can't see how this is sustainable, uh, the uh, Starbuck block agreement. So it's been a great uh, agreement for Exxon and its partners. If you also look at cost recovery, uh, um, Charles mentioned it already that last it was 7.5 billion. Now, uh, that Exxon could do the projections for this year is 8.5. Now, the cost, the average cost for a uh, flow FPSO, sort of these uh, oil extraction and production uh, boats offshore, is about 10 billion. So, if you see these numbers, it means that uh, Exxon can recover. The money that they forked out to build these boats within, let's say, one and a half years. So this is also unprecedented how fast they can basically get their money back again. And uh, the question is, is this necessary that they get their investments back within one and a half year? Or can we stretch this much longer and the Guyanese people get more of actually their own resources? <laughs> Back to you, Charles. And Dr. Hahn did mention that the body vice president says to extract as much as possible out of Guyana in the shortest possible time. Gentlemen, the big elephant in the room is this. The government of Guyana, in opposition, 
the president says when he was running for the office of president that everything is on the table regarding the Exxon contract. In the manifesto, they said they will renegotiate the contract. In government, they have now backpedaled on that. So the question is, for us to get this new model that you're proposing, 55 barrels for every 100 produced, that will have to bring Exxon to the table. How does OTGN and Visage getting Exxon to the table to renegotiate the PSA? Dr. Bradley, you want to start? Yeah, maybe I go first. <laughs> Now, I think what we have to keep in mind is, and I think that's where uh, the government has to be very firm. It's the resources of Guyana, and we control the land and the resources. Exxon is a partner that assists Guyana in extracting these resources, which means that we, can set, we are setting the terms. Of course, we signed a contract that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we signed a contract for the production of this oil, how the revenue is being shared. But, you know, contracts can be changed if it's beneficial to both partners. So, first of all, I think we should approach Exxon, point out that certain aspects of this contract are not sustainable, like the absence of any taxation for the duration of the contract. It also violates OECD rules. That call for corporate uh, uh, international uh, companies that they should pay at least 15% minimal corporate taxes. It turns out that all CARICOM members have signed that OECD agreement except for Guyana and Suriname. And this is something that uh, I, on behalf of OGGN, have pointed out in a letter that was published in uh, Kaiju News and Stabrit News uh, a couple of months ago. I have heard no feedback from the government on this, why Guyana is not signing these OECD uh, 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 recommendations. As I would like to turn, uh, re recapitulate again, all CARICOM member states except Suriname and Guyana have signed this. Why aren't we doing this? This is like a starting point because if we did this, we could also get back to Exxon and tell them, look, uh, with, a, with a grace period, we should move over to a new model. Uh, the other thing is, how do you get Exxon to the table? Uh, Exxon, of course, says, and the agreement says, they only get the uh, renegotiations only happen if both parties agree. Now, there are measures how to do that. I mean, uh, Guyana has been approving um, the environmental permits in record time for each new oil project. Does this have to be this way? We can maybe just take time to do this. And there are other issues, you know, each for expat that is working in Guyana needs a work permit. Instead of getting these work permits within one month, it could take a half a year. And you can, of course, make life a little bit more difficult, which brings, uh, you know, Exxon and its partners to the table. I mean, these are just some off the top ideas. But I think the important thing is that one goes proud to the table. It's our re uh, resources that we're going to talk about it. And Exxon is not a superpower. And we don't talk to the local people. We get the head of Exxon to come to Guyana to talk to us. You don't have, you don't go to Houston. You have these people come to your country. And that's how you negotiate with, uh, with these corporations. Because if you go to Houston, it's on their territory. It has to be on our territory in Georgetown. And I think that's the way you have to do this. And uh, of course, it will take time. You know, there's the example of Panama that had uh, renegotiated uh, uh, its mining deals with a bunch of companies. I don't have all the details, but it took two to three years, and the mining companies were balking against it. But they did an agreement about six months, nine months ago. So it can be done, but you have to be determined, and you have to have a plan, and you have to know what you want. And uh, I can't see none of these things right now on the table. And if they are around, then the vice president who is in charge of this entire sector has not been sharing it with us. Back to you, Charles. Dr. Hunt, um, yeah. Trinidad recently also changed their contract with, with um, our company. Mm -hmm. How yeah, is so like Exxon come to the table? Well, I joined with Andre's description and yours as well. 
you know, um, the suburb block has been the risks. That means we know there is oil out there. And having a situation where the contract that you've signed before didn't have all this information about what is available is now opening new pastures and new grounds for us to look at what we can have a more equitable contract. Um, we cannot keep going in this direction. The point is what we are getting isn't equitable. And to slow down the process is one way of dealing with bringing Exxon to the table. They have a responsibility to their shareholders to have a certain rate of return on their investments. And let me, as we talk about that, you'd note that their return on investment based on profits is a small amount. But in the real terms, what they're getting or suggesting to us is far lower than what the markets in the oil sector earns. So we know that the accounting that we're working with doesn't make a lot of sense. So for us, we got to find a way to slow down the process and bring these people to the table and treat us, and treat us as a country. What we have here is a company telling a sovereign nation that they can't run their own business. We will control and do everything to our advantage. That is now how the world works. Companies do not control sovereign nations. And Guyana is a sovereign nation, and we have to stand up for people at every occasion. That's my contribution right now. But Dr. Brandley, the government is saying, listen, based on the scientists around the world, they're saying, hey, oil will be, in a few years, there'll be no more use for oil. So we need to drill now and we need to get it now. What do you say of that? Is that one condition that prevents the government from saying, hey, Exxon, come, you got to come back to the table because we need to get our fair share because they're saying, let's drill now, let's get all the revenue now. And as Dr. Hunt said, Exxon VP said, let us get everything that we can get now because we don't know what can happen in the near future. What, what, well, what you know, else? Uh, I mean, there, there is, of course, you know, uh, there's definitely some grounds uh, for that. And I, as I mentioned, I think the rapid development of, uh, you know, uh, going to have uh, by the end of the year, we're going to have uh, Payara going online. Uh, has been, you know, beneficial to the country in terms of uh, getting an additional source of revenue. And, you know, it's not a small resource. It's 90% of Guyana's exports in value is oil. It's 90%, and that within three years. Huh? So we have to keep this in mind. Unfortunately, we are not taxing it again. I have to come back again to that. Uh, so that is leaving the country, which leaves us with a huge GDP, <laughs> Uh, per capita and actually has already negative consequences for Guyana because if you uh, look at the value of that oil leave in the country divided by the people, suddenly Guyana is a high income country, which also means that for developmental projects, we are not getting uh, 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 loans at favorable rates for a poor country that most people conceive the country is. And the general population has not seen much of a change because it's not really been trickling down to them that much. Uh, so uh, we are running in a situation where we are perceived as rich at about the general Guyanese person on the street doesn't see it. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has all types of consequences. So I think we really have to do a change. And I think the other thing that we have to really be, you know, totally clear, Exxon is not a charity. It's a company to make profit. And it's mm -hmm. our job to regulate the profit that we think is fair that they can make in our country. And this is nothing to do about being mean to them. They they act, they know how the business is. And uh, one thing that all companies do not want to have, they don't want to have unpredictable situations. So if Guyana raises the issue of that they want to renegotiate the uh, uh, current production sharing agreement for the Star Group block, sooner or later, the CEO uh, of Exxon sitting in Houston will say, look, I'd rather have a controlled situation where we renegotiate things and we're going to bring it into a situation that looks better than we have constant uncertainty and maybe a shutdown or a 
uh, a block of further expansion. With regard to, and I didn't address actually your point in terms of uh, oil and how long we're going to need oil. Uh, I think burning oil is a bad idea and we should get away from burning oil. But oil is, of course, also a very important resource in the petrochemical industry. Uh, it's a, uh, uh, a starting product for all different types of uh, uh, chemicals that we use. Plastics are developed out of oil. So there's going to be always a use of oil. It might be a little bit less, but, uh, uh, you know, for, for foreseeable future, we'll need oil. Uh, and its products, uh, not necessary to burn it, which is probably the worst thing we can do with it because it's too precious, in my opinion, but uh, for other purposes. And the other thing which I think uh, allows Guyana to be in a position that they can afford arresting the oil field development for a while is because if you have three or four FPSOs producing, and if you look at the uh, our sovereign wealth fund, the amount of money that flows in there that can be withdrawn is capped. So if you look at the numbers, you can maybe withdraw 1.4 billion US dollars max uh, with the withdrawal rules that the current administration has put into place. So uh, that's the max that you can put into your uh, the consolidated fund uh, for uh, you know, annual use in the country. Uh, so, and that is reached. So if you have 10, you can't withdraw more. Uh, the rest would just go into your savings. So what we are just doing is by putting Exxon onto pressure and maybe having an arrest of, uh, or a, a slowing down of oil field development is that the money that goes into our savings will be delayed. So this will be the consequence. It doesn't mean that we will get no money. <laughs> And Exxon doesn't want that because they want those revenues coming in. So uh, by asking for nego renegotiation, we are not stopping everything. We are just uh, arresting further development until the Starbuck block uh, uh, agreement has been revised, that it's more in favor of Guyana. And as I said, taxation is important. Every Guyanese is expected to pay value-added taxes, to pay income tax, if they qualify, how come the largest contributor to our economy is tax exempt for the duration of the contract? In my simple view, no government can survive an election down the road if they are advocating that the largest contributor to uh, our uh, economy doesn't pay taxes. Very simple. And Dr. Dr. Brandley, you're, before, Dr. Brandley, before you come on, Dr. Brandley, you're so right in that um, oil is not only for driving cars or, or, or um, boats and uh, trucks. There's so many product that comes from oil, um, the byproducts, and the, and the population of the world is increasing. So the demand for other products is there. So they need to rush to drill, baby, drill now because they think global warming, Oil will stop producing. That's not true. But Dr. Hunt, in, we have yeah. limited time now. Time has run out of us. What about if, what are the chances of Exxon and his partners agreeing to changing the current PSA? Uh, before I attempt to provide an answer, I just want to go back to one point, which I think is relevant. The, the idea that Guyana's GDP per capita is now around the highest, around the highest in the world, it's costing Guyana because we've been pushed into an area to borrow money at higher interest rates. We cannot get lower cost money to be borrowed. Now, that is a false set of calculations because your GDP per capita takes only into account what you produce. What we're supposed to be counting is Guyana gross national income. Yeah. I want to make this point. Gross national income will be a more accurate measure because you're not considering yourself with the 8 to 5.5% maximum that is extracted when Exxon takes its money out of the economy. Dr. So, Hunt, we have lost your picture. Oh, sorry. Yeah, so basically what you're looking at here is we want to have a situation in which the idea that GNI should be the measure, not GDP per capita. 
that's what we have to change because that's a negative for us. It pushes Guyana into no concessional lending any longer. So this is a negative coming to Guyana as a result of using our own natural resources by somebody else who is not paying taxes to us. Excellent so, point. Excellent point. I like that. So when you consider how to help, uh, what should we do to bring them to the table? That's a point that should be made every time because Exxon is costing Guyana to borrow money going forward. Now, we mentioned earlier some of the things we can do. We could slow down this process because the risk, they, we have the risk, they have the risk, the Starbrook block. Everybody know there is oil there now and they know how to get it. So we have the advantage in de dealing with some of these matters. And I'd like to see a different approach taken to get these matters resolved. Thank you, Charles. Dr. Bradley, what are the chances of Exxon coming to the table? Of course, they they will. Uh, you have they're going to be dragging their feet and they're going to be screaming and shouting. That's just a fact, and uh, we've heard that already. Uh, there's a uh, you know uh, the uh, Alistair Rutledge would definitely not say in public that they're going to be willingly coming to the table because, of course, the model works for them greatly. And uh, we don't should not only just get this uh, uh, you know personified. At, towards uh, the uh, local head of the Exxon operations in Guyana, Alistair Rutledge. There's also John Hess, who tells his shareholders uh, on, on a regular basis what a great uh, a place for profits Guyana is. So it's clear that they don't want to change the model. So they're going to be, uh, you know, dragging their feet. They're going to be fighting against it uh, at all different levels. But this should not deter us from really going ahead. I, unfortunately, I think, you know, if we had a common strategy between both uh, major parties in Guyana, we could, uh, uh, you know, coordinate this better. But as we all know, uh, the uh, consensus building is very difficult, particularly in this area. Uh, from my personal view, I thought that the whole uh, discussion about the uh, uh, petroleum activities bill that is now uh, act uh, had opportunities there to pave the way for new discussions and for new renegotiations uh, the opposition have put in their amendments to the uh, draft bill of the government one of them was actually very interesting they were asking that uh, within uh, by the end of the decade all existing uh, production sharing agreements should be rolled over into uh, models that have been uh, approved in the in the uh, production uh, in the petroleum activities bill so that would have been you know setting the uh, uh, you know setting things in place together with my suggestion for example that uh, Guyana should sign the OECD agreement uh, of a minimal tax of 15% so these are, if you have a strategy, you set these types of pillars in there that uh, uh, make it very clear to Exxon and its partners that things are going to be changing. And just imagine the U.S. government, would they agree to a contract which would punish and ask for uh, 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 damage payments if Guyana introduces taxes? That's what's written in the Starbuck Block Agreement that Guyana is not allowed to tax Exxon for the duration of the contract. And if they do so, they are uh, uh, liable for any losses and damages. This is outrageous, in my opinion, because it undermines uh, the, and in the US, it's, it's the Congress who sets taxes and nobody has the right to uh, uh, tell a sovereign nation that they can't raise taxes. And if you cannot raise taxes, you are no longer a sovereign nation because you can't control uh, your revenue stream and adjust it to the needs of the country. And that's what this agreement is actually doing. It, it limits Guyana's ability to adjust its revenue stream for the benefit of its people. And I think this has to be changed. And it has to be fair, of course, because, uh, 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 you know, you don't want to... Uh, 
uh, have a situation where other investors might think you can't trust Guyana. But so it can be done. It's tough. And of course, it's more convenient just to sit there if, uh, you know, some people might profit from the way the situation is. Gentlemen, we're out of time now. It was a great discussion. Um, we will be back, audience, we'll be back uh, um, um, the ter Thursday after next. Every um, second Thursday, we'll be on the air with this program, um, All Talk with OGG and Guyana. In our inaugural program tonight, we are very honored to have two professionals in their own field, Dr. Andre Brandley. He's a professor there in Switzerland. And of course, Dr. Hunt, who is also a professor and also former ambassador to Guyana. Gentlemen, anything in closing? I think the program that OGN will put on will certainly bring information to the Guyanese public so they could understand the workings of this industry. And I'm hoping that with the full understanding of the Guyanese people, we can get movement in the right direction. I look forward to a better return on Guyana natural resources. And as you remember, natural resources, non-renewable non natural resources are exhaustible and future generations should not blame us for not doing our job well. And they have, we have a responsibility to that future generation. And this is a time for us to step up and get the job done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Han. Dr. Brandley. Uh, I think I don't have much more to add to it. I just want to make it clear to the Guyanese public that with uh, oil talk, uh, with OGGN Guyana, that you get the uh, you know unbiased information about what OGGN stands, that we are on the side of the people that we want to have oil contracts and the whole oil industry run in a professional, in a transparent, and in a manner that involves also all stakeholders in the country. So we would like to see, for example, that uh, you know new model contracts are broadly discussed. We do not want to see a situation where the government sits over this for months gives the public two weeks' time to respond, and then there's not really a process where you can see what was taken up from the uh, public's response, how did the model contract, was it adjusted? I have no idea what was at all submitted within those two uh, weeks that the public had a chance to look at 200-page-plus documents. And, and I think we need much more a dialogue where we all stakeholders in Guyana really look at what we want to, to have. Where are we going? What are we going to do with our, our oil resources? And I think a forum like this uh, uh, oil talk with OGG in Guyana is a forum where we can uh, articulate these concerns and also provide suggestions and new ideas to the Guyanese public. At the end, it's the Guyanese people that should have the say uh, with its elected uh, members of parliament that uh, these decisions are taken and been broadly discussed. And it's possible. I have seen it with the radioactivity law that went through parliament, it went to a select committee, and uh, it was broad consensus. Both parties voted, voted for the radioactivity regulation laws. Uh, a very technical issue, but it can be done. So it's not that the two parties cannot work together, they can work on technical issues. It just means that we have to expand it to all issues that enter Parliament. That's basically my point, and uh, we are here to make this clear to the public. Thank you, gentlemen. And it's very it's very interesting to know that today being our first day in the year, it's a super moon and it's also a blue moon. Very auspicious day, and we want to wish all Guyanese all the best. I hope they were able to see the super moon tonight. Um, I'm going to go out now and see if I can see it here in New York. But all, all the best to all our viewers, to you gentlemen, and to Kaitur Radio. Until the next time, God bless our great country of Guyana. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye and Bye -bye. good night to everyone. Yes, good night. Kaitur Radio. Covering Guyana from coast to coast. Demerara and Essequibo 99.1 FM. Burbies 99.5 FM.